This episode of Finding Demon Surf Fishing is being brought to you by Ninja Tackle. Go to NinjaTackleVA.com and look at everything that they got going on out there in Virginia. I'll tell you what, something new just hit the market and you're going to want to get your hands on it if you like those extra long rods, especially if you're a Hatteras guy or gal. I've heard some good stuff. The Ninja Tackle 13 foot 3 inch monster rod yeah it's in stock it is so cool i'm so happy for matt that he got that thing in whole lot of good changes there he's also got the seven footer dagger series up to the other 12 foots you guys know i talk about them all the time i love them they are just phenomenal rods i've had no problems with them caught some great fish with them absolutely excellent if you need to get your hands on rigs bait other rods and reels he's got it all in there if you're into firearm and firearm accessories he got you covered there too ninja tactical whole lot of good stuff there so head on over to ninjatackleva.com get your order in today New week, new episode. Hope you're doing well wherever you are and the sun is shining. You're getting out fishing because that's the stuff. That's why we do this, right? This week we're getting on the old digital plane. That's right. We're traveling again. We're heading up north. We're heading up to my old happy place known as New England. Yeah. We're going to be talking with Ryan Collins of My Fishing Cape Cod and came across him when I was doing a social media search and it's been educational for me just doing the dive, just looking at his stuff. It, it's been fun surf boats you name it It, lots of really really good information products uh, there's just so much to talk about so without further ado and running my mouth this whole time getting on to the intro let's get you on the show welcome to the show ryan thanks for coming on today sir yeah thanks for having me brian great to be here so you fish primarily in the northeast i see the main my fishing cape cod obviously the name there where do you basically hail as your fishing grounds well, I grew up in the town of Bourne, which is right at the Cape Cod Canal, which perhaps some of your listeners have heard about. It's a pretty legendary place to go fishing for striped bass, and you really never know what you might encounter down there. So that's where I am right now, and that's where I've been for a long time. I've, I live five minutes down the street from where I grew up, so I didn't make it very far. <laughs> Uh, but you know your area so that's cool it's all good you've done a ton of travel too i mean this is this isn't just in your backyard you've gone and done quite a bit in your adventures yeah we've kind of made a second home for ourselves down in costa rica a wonderful place called playa zancudo and then another spot cabo matapalo and it's right on the edge of some excellent like conservation land and jungle so not only is there great fishing but you might see a sloth you wake up to monkeys so that's really been really awesome and if anybody's thinking about going to costa rica i definitely recommend it (laughs) Uh, that's definitely on my top five list to go Uh, that place is has been amazing when i was seeing some things your website got me like looking at stuff and then taking a look at uh Oh my gosh, Las Busos with the way they do things down a little bit further. Uh, and just that whole region is amazing fishing. It is. The people are super nice. It's helpful if you know a little Spanish, that would go a long way. And where we go, it's just one little dirt road. So the pace of life is really slower. And it's just really nice. You just walk where you need to go. And if I catch a fish, it's a bonus. Oh, man, that sounds wonderful, especially nowadays. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, if all his social medias are going to be linked back on findingdemosurfishing.com. It'll also be where you found this podcast. You'll be able to go to that. Yeah, highly recommend you take a look at Ryan's website, which is going to be myfishingcapecod.com. And if you go in there, you're going to see right at the very top, you're going to see a bunch of icons. Click regions. Just Just click regions. And then just start right-clicking on open new tabs, and you're you're going to be on an adventure. You you have built a, a, I guess you could call it a catalog library. I mean, you have built a monster of information here. It's just a cornucopia to pick up from. Yeah, we have thousands and thousands of posts and videos and articles, and it's not just me, which is really cool. Over the last 10 years, 
our membership base has contributed thousands and thousands of posts inside our forum. And it's really turned into a nice community of anglers in there. And folks are sharing information. And, you know, with fishing, it's always a balance. You know, you don't give it all away, but <laughs> everybody's there to support one another. And I think that's what some people need is just a little, a little helping hand to kind of, you know, get going, whether it's a new area or a new type of fishing. I think you probably know what I mean, Brian. Oh, I get you. I think everybody listening gets you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, th th that was one of the premises for me starting this. It was like, you know, yeah, there's a bunch of YouTubers and nothing against them. Love you guys. You guys do good stuff with your entertaining stuff. And the, you get a couple snippets of knowledge pieces, but it seemed like the long form content and knowledge content was coming from online articles or uh, magazines or a, a few, a few websites in general. You, you weren't, you could go, you couldn't go one place, but it was, you knew if you wanted entertainment, you went to YouTube. If you wanted education, you went to certain other places. And now seeing these as I've grown in the podcast world, it's amazing which ones it is. It's like, okay, they're good. They're starting out there. Holy crap. That's a monster library. It's a, it's just so much fun to try to see all this knowledge and seeing people share it openly. Like, look, I want you to catch fish. That It's not about winning. It's about catching fish, and we're all going to get there. Absolutely. And thank you for checking out the site. That's really cool that you went on it, and we're clicking around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was my fun one after I sent you the message. Um <laughs> It was it was funny because I saw your podcast. I'm like, what the hell? And then I started looking at him and I started listening. I was like, oh man, he's doing really cool things. So I I was uh, I had to do the you know shoot my shot and be like, come on, you know you want to share some more fun stuff on another platform. So <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it was it anytime. Yeah. Well, let's get in here. Let's start at the very beginning. Wow, well, tell us your story and what got you into fishing. Well, I guess it all began on. A Captain John trip, which is a party boat out of Plymouth, which is where the Pilgrims landed. And I went out when I was, I don't know, five years old with my dad's seventh grade class on a field trip. So I, I was kind of a stowaway on the trip. And it was a whale watch, but I was just looking forward to the fishing part afterwards. They let you catch mackerel. And I think mackerel fishing in particular is a great way to get kids hooked on the sport because you drop a rig into the water and you can pull up four or five mackerel at a time. And I was just hooked from that trip on. That, that's how it began. And I still remember that trip to this day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that, would, that must have been really fun. Oh, man. <laughs> just drop it. Yeah, mackerel fishing is really great. Yeah, for kids. Yeah. Okay. It hooked me. And the tug was the drug and it got started early. Okay, very good. Nice. Uh, what has been, uh, what's your favorite thing about fishing? I think, you know, where I'm at right now, where I'm helping other people to try to get as much out of the activity as I've been fortunate to get from it, it's just the ability for fishing to expose people to the natural world and put them out there. A lot of times for some people out of their element, it's completely new, but you're like right in the ecosystems, you're right in the circle of life, so to speak. You know, here on Cape Cod, especially if you go tuna fishing, you got to see whales, you got to see dolphins. We see great white sharks, birds coming down, all sorts of different species of fish all inhabiting the same environment. And it's really, I think the best thing about fishing and what I enjoy the most is getting into that arena. And I think that's a super big benefit of the sport in general for for everybody, whether they realize it or not, when you're fishing, you're out there in nature. And there's just so many benefits to being, you know, out there in nature, especially in today's day and age when it's so easy to, you know, get stuck behind a computer. And that happens to me all the time, too. But being able to get out there is what it's all about. Yeah, it's the nature of adulting, which, you know, our parents try to tell us it was a trap, but we didn't listen. It's just nowadays mm -hmm. is how it is. The grind keeps on. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with your travels this one's going to be a weird one for you to answer so because you've caught a lot of fish and you've seen a lot of great things and made some great memories are there any bucket list fish for you to catch uh geez looking ahead i haven't really um thought about that too much for the next couple of years here 
for a while it was rooster fish. Oh yeah. And I was really fortunate to get some beautiful roosters from the beach over the past five, six years down in Costa Rica. So that was really my bucket list fish for a while. And you know, since I've been fortunate to catch one, geez, I gotta think up something new now for moving <laughs> forward. <laughs> goals i love it okay so you got one to come up yeah with. all right um so with the travels this actually ties in nicely to that has there is there any more places like a dream place that you want to go fish and talk about i think it'd be nice to go to australia i had an awesome opportunity to study abroad in Cairns, australia which is the black marlin capital of the planet and you know i just I was doing too much hanging out with my buds there and going out to uh, bars and traveling and backpacking. I never got around to fishing, but I stood on the beach so often and just looked out and just wondered what was going on out there. So I love to get back there. Uh, my wife and I have talked about it. There's a place called Harvey Bay as well, which I love to check out over in Australia. And aside from that, I think New Zealand would be just a, a wonderful place to visit as well. So. Those are my uh, two big pipe dreams, and I'm sure I can find some bucket list fish there. And next time we talk, maybe the bucket list fish will be a black marlin. <laughs> oh, oh, man, that would be so fun. Def oh, yeah. like, I'm, like, I'm already smiling with happiness over here with the thought of that. That'd be cool. Oh, yeah. But, you know, there's just so much here in my backyard. You know, I'm, I'm literally in my backyard right now, and I could walk to a pond that's got largemouth bass and yellow perch. I got the canal right down the street here. So it's becoming more and more challenging to leave here, really. Um, we're just really blessed with what we've got going on here on the Cape. Yeah, I could hear the crows. I was like, man, it sounds like you're in the back. And as it, the weirdest thing happened when I heard the first crow. I, and for those of you who don't laugh at me too much when you hear this, I could actually smell fall. I, I know you got some snow, like you said, when we were talking pre-show, but New England has a certain smell at fall. And I don't know how, I don't know why, but I could smell it when you said that, or when I heard that bird. It's so weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got all sorts of crows going wild right now. And we had coyotes last night around 1130 at night, maybe 15 or, it sounded like 15 or 20 coyotes. I don't know if it was that many, but they were howling. So had an owl howling last night too. So I don't take that for granted. The, you know, that's what that's like fishing, too. When you're out there, you're hearing all these sounds that you don't hear when you're inside. And I think that has a, a nice beneficial influence as well. And for you right now, it brought back that smell of fall. So, <laughs> you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, good times. I uh, Before I move on to the next question, I guess I'm going to go with a little sidebar, the fun thing. I know a ton of my listeners aren't in New England. I'm, I'm finally kind of growing a little bit more up there. And a lot of people, have, uh, a couple of people I've talked to, I can't say a lot, have asked me about New England fishing. And I've told several people that, yes, Florida's got a lot of great fish. But on the same one, like if you look at regions, certain regions have amazing fishing. New England is no stranger to that. I mean, you can be on the beach in the morning knocking out and getting some striper then you can get on the boat and go offshore hit the shelf and you can go after togs cod uh tuna you, you there's so many things you can go after you want big bluefish hey no problem that's that's a monday there is a huge amount of fishing available in the new england region and it's great fishing oh absolutely and then offshore too the canyons are a three, four hour run. So you've got yellowfin tuna, wahoo, a chance at blue marlin. And even right now, this past week, there's been incredible amounts of giant tuna around. And here we are, it's almost Christmas and folks are still hooking into five, seven, 800 pound giant bluefin tunas, not that far from, from shore. You know, sometimes they come in within a mile of the beach. So there's a lot going on and even during the winter, there's great freshwater fishing. A lot of the ponds are stocked with trout. So everybody thinks about the stripers and the tuna when they hear of Cape Cod, and rightfully so. But there's lots of great freshwater fishing too, especially during the off season. Mm -hmm. Great place to be. Yeah, the 
I, I think you get them. Uh, I, I had a lot more a little bit further north of you. I mean, getting in with the brown trout, the brook trout, uh, the fishing, you can just really get after it no matter what. And then mid, if you get the hard winter, you know, you can get into a little bit into the ice fishing. It depends on where you're at. Um, but it's just a great fisherman's paradise, really. And, and the Cape is no stranger to the love for that because there's so much you can play with. So what's going on right now in Pensacola? What's everybody going after right now in Florida? Mm, so Florida winter fishing is always fun. So we've got the blackfin tuna, or the, the bluefin's little itty-bitty tiny little brother. Uh, that's always fun to get after. Uh, they come in, and it's kind of a weird thing about here with the way our water and shelf is. You can actually catch these blackfin tuna off the Navarre Pier. Uh, there, You can get after that. You can go maybe a mile offshore in your kayak and get after them. Lots of good fishing with that. You've still got some running around. you got some other pelagics that are still ho- holding around you can go with there. And then from the surf, you can get into the black drum, the red drum, pompano, whiting, uh, lots of great species. So winter fishing here, uh, though it changes definitely from the extreme hot time of fall and spring, still phenomenal fishing area. Lots of good stuff to play with here. Right, right. So I, well, I might have to uh, make a trip down south at some point. Oh, I haven't done much really. fishing in, in Florida at all, really. We'll just trade. So that would be new for me. I'll come up there and fish with you. You show me the ropes there, and then you come down here, and I'll bring everybody I know that's awesome that that can help you out, and we'll get you on fish here. It's like a perfect trade. Well, that's an incredible opportunity. (laughs) Sounds like I really talked myself into a good deal. Sold. I love it. All right, last question in this category, and we'll get you moving on to the knowledge pieces here. Can you share a memorable fishing story, including any kind of unexpected catches or challenging fishing situations? Oh, gosh, where to begin? Um, (laughs) The memorable fishing story, I guess, would be catching a giant tuna with my dad. We got a 780-pounder maybe six or seven years ago. And that was a big day for him because he's always wanted to catch a giant tuna because when he was younger, his brother was going out tuna fishing, and he asked my dad if he wanted to go. And you know, back then they had never caught a giant tuna before. And my dad figured, Oh, you know, he's got no chance. We get skunked every time we go. And that day, my uncle got an 800, uh, 78 pounder, I believe. And it's kind of haunted my dad ever since. So to be able to, uh, finally catch one with him a few years ago, that was probably a top memory right there. Oh, man, you got the core memory with Dad. I mean, come on, man. It doesn't get better. Yeah, no, it, it really doesn't. So hopefully we can make it happen again this year. I know he's he's been after me to get him back out there on our own boat. We've, we've caught tuna with some other captains here on Cape Cod the past few years, but he wants to do it again on our little 21-footer. So maybe we'll give it a shot. Oh, that'd be so cool. I look forward to following you on the sites and seeing if that happens. Oh, or no, not if, when. Oh, that's going to be fun. Definitely is. Um, well, before we move into the tips and tricks, let's go ahead and knock out a bait check. It's been about 19 minutes, which, hey, if you're fishing from the beach, you guys know, it's good to check your bait because they're stealers and they will take from you and it's no good. It is your first bait check of the episode. Yeah, yeah, like I said, check that bait. Make sure it's good. This bait check is being brought to you by DS Custom Tackle, the Delaware guys. Yeah, they got you covered. DSCustomTackle.com is a great website to go to to get your hands on floats, rigs, teasers, hooks. You name it, they've got it. If there's stuff that you may can't really find, actually, if you reach out to them, they might be able to find it for you and help you out. If you are a rig maker or looking to make your own uh, in your area, regions like that, and you're looking for a supplier, yep, they can help you out there too. DS Custom tackle.com is a website go take a look get yourself set up for success so with the knowledge and let's get into this so basically i'm looking at your personal trips all that fun stuff uh, especially when it comes to the beach because you do a lot of shoreline fishing whether it's in you know like you said whether it's up there in the cape or down on costa or any of the other places that you've gone so let's start off there how before you go out to fish how do you plan your fishing trip well i definitely take a look at the weather that's that's a big one you know, there's been times in Costa Rica where the swell is just too dangerous to even enter the water. But here on Cape Cod, a lot of uh, fish activity depends on the wind. So, for example, there's some beaches here that 
when you get a northeast breeze, especially later in the summer or early fall, that northeast wind brings in a lot of waves and a lot of life gets pushed up against the beach. And I always think with an onshore breeze, I feel in most situations, not all, but my chances of getting into nice stripers and bluefish from the shore is a little better. So I'm definitely looking at the weather, taking a look at places where I've done well in the past. You know, I think a lot of successful surf casters keep a very detailed log book. I do to a degree, but it's probably not as good as it could be. But I'm always thinking about where I did well this specific week last year, because stripers in particular, I think have a real tendency to come back to the same spots year after year. So after a couple of years of surf casts, and if you pay attention, you can start to figure out patterns. And then the third thing, of course, would be tide. Obviously, especially here on Cape Cod, we've got some places where at low tide, there's miles of sand flats. And then at high tide, that same spot is covered by 10 feet of water. So it's a combination of the weather and conditions, places I've done well in the past, and then, of course, tide. Those are the three things I first think about. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that the tide swing in the in the Atlantic has always been something that uh, is easy for me to forget here because we only have one tide a day in the Gulf of Mexico, so it's it's easy to be like, oh wait, top two or top three, bottom three, top three, bottom three, and the water's going to be moving. Okay, you got to be flexible. So ten feet, that's a lot of movement. Oh, big time movement. You know, the Cape Cod Canal has got a current that sweeps through there five miles per hour, no problem. So there's a lot of water that's getting pushed around Cape Cod. And if you just look at Cape Cod on Google Earth, I mean, you can see why there's lots of rips and drop offs because when the glaciers created Cape Cod, they left huge sandy shoals, they carved out rocky spots. So by no way is it a uniform area. There's a lot of structure and a lot of water getting pushed through that structure. Man, it's, we all know rips, that's a feeding frenzy right there. That's their happy. They're going right after the easy targets. They don't need to be working for it. They want it easy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think stripers definitely prefer an easy meal when available, and don't we all? We'd rather <laughs> just have it served to us. <laughs> yes, very true. Okay, so we talked about the your trip now. Let's talk about spot location, uh, or as in finding it. What are you looking for to select your spot? Well, with regards to striped bass, they're such a diverse creature. So there's areas, especially on upper Cape Cod, mid Cape Cod, Buzzards Bay, where there's lots of boulders and lots of weeds and all sorts of habitat that would naturally draw any passing fish in for a look because there's crabs and lobsters and small fish around these rocks and boulders. And then on top of that, any place where there's current moving through an area like that, I think is an added bonus. So, you know, here in this area, I'm always keeping my eyes open for structure. But then the other thing would be bait movement. So we've got Cape Cod National Seashore, which is 40 miles of just sandy beach. So to the east of the Cape, it's almost all sand, but to the west, it starts becoming rockier. You know, it gets back to what I said before about all the diverse types of habitat we have here. But on the outer Cape, I would definitely be paying attention to bait movement. We've got big schools of mackerel, sand eels, bunker that move up and along those beaches and in Cape Cod Bay. And if you can time it right and be on the beach when there's a big ecosystem of life there, you know, it can be a fish on every single cast. So those are, uh, I guess, in a nutshell, that's, my best answer to that question, Brian. That's a great one. <laughs> it really is. Um, I hope I'm not rambling too much here, but oh. you know, I just love talking about this stuff. Dude, you couldn't ramble if you wanted to on this show. Are you kidding? Rambling is normally the best part where people are like, uh-huh, because I'm that guy. I mean, I, I, I get the cheated advantage that I get to hear it all in the beginning. But no, rambling, mm-hmm. not even close. You're just sharing knowledge. That's all that is. Um all right, Roger that. You, you bring up the cool point here, and it kind of ties well into this next question because you're talking about boulders and you're talking about things, visuals. Uh, how can surf anglers read and interpret the beach conditions to identify productive fishing spots and locate these schools of fish? 
Well, that's a tough one to really answer, so to speak, aside from just time on the water. You know, I think there's some anglers and some fishermen who just understand their quarry. And for a lot of people, you just got to spend time out there. And after, you know, I'm not saying spend 30 years before this happens, but the more time you spend out there, even if it's just a few days, you got to start understanding where stripers like to hide out, how they like to react to current, how they might position themselves behind a rock. Um, but in general, I guess with, with bass, geez, I mean, I think it really boils down to just time spent on the beach. Really? Fair, fair call. Uh, you made me think of something when you were talking about hiding behind a rock. It's kind of like, uh, I, I am the world's worst freshwater angler. Uh, I know that. And I, I can unfortunately tout that banner. Um, but one thing I remember always seeing was kind of like, uh, salmon, you know, they're waiting in the water. The water's coming towards them. They're just swimming wi- against the current, just chilling. They're just waiting for something. Something's going to come near me. I'm going to turn left. I'm going to eat it. Then I'm going to turn right and I'm going to eat it with our world especially up there with big rocks. I mean, that's something for them too. It's like, I'm just going to wait here. And uh, oh, all right, here comes something. If you position that bait in that one, that's going to be an easy hookup, essentially. I mean, that, that's what I can see in that picture. Right, right. And the same activity happens here. Like, for example, at the Cape Cod Canal, there's a lot of current moving through the canal. And there's actual places where they like dynamited the canal. So there's like caverns down there. I've taken my boat through the canal many times and just seen where it goes from like 38 feet deep, plummets down to 65, and then we'll come right back up to 40 feet on the other side. And when the current's running, it doesn't happen all the time, but when there's fish in the canal, they'll be right down there in that hole that is literally completely out of the current. So it's like a nice little place for them to hang out. And if you can get your jig down there, or your eel, and if they're in the feeding mode, you know, it's pretty much a guarantee. You just got to get your bait in the right spot. So there are plenty of situations like that, but there's also lots of situations where the stripers are just out in open water where there's no structure and very little current, and they're, you know, chasing balls of bait, mackerel, squid, and it's a very active fishery, like the bass are moving at a very high rate of speed. So you might cover a mile in no time trying to keep up with all the life. So on one end of the spectrum, they'll sit in the same spot for a tide, but on the other end of the spectrum, they'll be in the same spot for less than a second as they chase down bait in open water. (laughs) Ah, fishing is fun. (laughs) Oh yeah. 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 That's a nice thing about stripers and some of these other species because, you know, tautog fishing, for example, it's more or less pretty similar every time you go. There are exceptions, but you're just finding rocky structure, dropping a crab down and anchoring up, and that's that. But with striped bass, there's so many ways of catching them from the fly rod to wireline trolling and everything in between. I guess that's why they're definitely our most popular fish. That's fun, but it's fun too. I mean, you can be, like you just said right there, you can be, if you're a fly angler and you want to try, hey, you can do it. It's not just a, it's not a 30 hour soak requirement. You know, you can get out there and have some fun. You can chunk it if you want, you can rig it and you can do so many different things for the species. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, you've had personal uh, familiarity with that growing up and in Connecticut. How did you normally fish down there for stripers? Oh, I wish I could say I did. Unfortunately for me, I was, uh, my surf fishing adventure did not start actually until I lived here. Uh, my family dynamic did not set me up for success to be able to do that. I, uh, the only, the only fishing that I got to do out of there was, uh, off the Thames, uh, and then a little bit out towards block. Uh, so it was a lot more just bottom fishing and drop fishing for blues, flounder, fluke you know i i didn't really get to enjoy the fun stuff so i'm i'm living vicariously of a childhood i missed through you and anyone else i get to talk to about new england oh i'm sad (laughs) ah no that's fine you know that's a great thing about fishing you know i talk to people who are just getting into it they've retired they're in their 50s or 60s and they want to pick it up they want to get out there on the water and 
they enjoy it so much more in many regards than people who have been at it for for a long time. They're like a little kid discovering the joys of fishing. So no matter what age you get started, there's no right or wrong way of going about it. Yeah, you nailed a, you nailed a good point there. It's timeless. It doesn't matter if you're three or eighty. You, if you can get a rod and reel in your hand, you're gonna feel that happiness, and it's it's going to get you. It is a great addiction. Yeah, and it can be a little frustrating at times. So if you hit a rough spot where your equipment is driving you nuts, you're not catching anything. You know, don't give up, especially if you're just getting started. Hang on, because that's all part of it. <laughs> Well, you talked into, let's, I mean, we did a good cool little segue there. And we're talking about flies or dropping down for rigs. Let's talk about what you like to do when you're surf casting for as far as setting yourself up with rigs. Well, how do you fish? Are you throwing out for a soak? Do you do a Carolina rig? What do you normally utilize? I love using everything from chunk bait to top water lures. And it's so easy to get overwhelmed with the amount of gear and tackle. So when people ask, you know, a question like that, it, my answer is usually this. I go out, if it's a place I've never fished before, with a lure for work in the surface, something like a one ounce, two ounce pencil popper, a lure for work in the midwater column, something like a Joe Bag Swarter or an SP Minnow, like a swimming lure that gets down a little bit, and then something for the bottom, typically a bucktail jig that you can work in the bottom portion of the water column. And that way, when you're striper fishing from the beach, you just kind of cover all your bases. So if you're just getting started, that's my advice. And then you can just go from there. Obviously, there's so many different types of topwater lures, for example. I mentioned a pencil popper, but you've also got Danny plugs. You've got a variety of soft plastic lures, which are a lot of fun to fish. So there's lots of different types of baits and styles. There's one place right down the street here where I'll use chunk mackerel and I'll swim out to a rock at uh, mid tide and I'll stay out there until low tide as the water's dropping. And on a good day, you'll see stripers just swimming in like three feet of water by this particular rock. And if you can just chuck a chunk of mackerel or a piece of dead squid in front of them, that striper will just come over and just eat it right in front of you. And it's just an absolute ball. So a lot of people, they might shy away from chunk bait because they think lures are more fun, but there's so many creative ways of catching striped bass. So I really think, take a look at where you gotta be fishing and try lots of new things. And you might stumble upon a spot like what I just described where, God, it's so much fun watching those fish come over and just take a chunk right in front of you. Oh. It's so exciting. Oh, like, I'm sitting there, we're like, oh, my God, I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, I've got videos of it on, on Instagram. So I love doing the underwater stuff for that reason, just to see fish from a cool perspective. It makes it so much more exciting. Yeah, the underwater footage has been fun to catch up. Um, what, what is the name of the company? Go Fish Cam um has really been kind of a cool little camera i've been seeing more and more there's another guy up there by you i can't say his name and i can't say his company yet um i met him at icast a couple years ago and he has some really really cool stuff that uh, he was working on but seeing the underwater of how they strike where they're hiding how they're moving it's like your own personal discovery channel absolutely absolutely and you do learn from those underwater videos, but I've discovered that capturing those shots is more challenging than hooking the fish. <laughs> yeah, so in, yeah, the, is. in the in the past year, I've caught a lot less fish, to be honest with you, because I'm just trying to catch the shot. You know, I'll put a camera on the line, which obviously hinders your fish ability when you have a camera on the line, but for me, it's worth it. And I love sharing those perspectives with people because now they have a whole new appreciation for what's going on below their boat or in the surf. Yeah. And you've got a neighbor over at Martha's Vineyard. I talked to on the show not too long ago. I guess it was about a little over a year ago um, with Island X lures. Uh, and I learned more about pencils. I didn't realize that that the pencil jig 
whether it's you know a barely a subsurface or floating off the top or sliding through that that is a really th- those style that is really effective up there it sure is and yeah i think you're talking about nick from island x lures yep. he was kind enough to invite me out i'll be fishing over on nantucket with him this past september and we used those pencils and we caught albies up to 34 inches which was much bigger than anything I've ever seen on Cape Cod. So shout out to Nick. That was an epic trip. And to see Albies crushing pencil poppers, I mean, a lot of times you're catching Albies using 10 pound fluorocarbon with a small epoxy jig and then catching them that way with like 30 pound tests and they're cranking lures that you could use for big bluefish. It was so much more fun <laughs> you know to be honest with you <laughs> oh it is yeah he's he's yeah. created a really good really really good lure and just a nice guy to boot i mean he, he's a lot of fun and uh, it's just been fun seeing his adventures and yeah that was that was a whole lot of encyclopedia knowledge for me of like okay i need that one 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 and using them it very very well smart design and I'm, I'm glad you guys got together that's really cool that you uh, that you did and got to play out there with the albies man that, those things fight they are they are feisty little creatures they really are and there's plenty of places to catch them from the beach whether it's some of the jetties we have or some of the sandy sandy beaches um they're a lot of fun they really are this just a a wide range of species you can catch you know from albies to spanish mackerel bonito in the late summer, early fall. And then, of course, the stripers, tog, you know, the list just goes on. Yeah, you guys got a great fishery up there. Um, so while we're talking about the fishery there, let, let's play this one, because this is the one that everybody hates having this conversation, and they're like, oh, this sucks. This is what I hate about it. What do you do, uh, or how do you adjust your tactics when the, uh, the bite isn't on fire? Well, most of the time it's not on fire. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> people, are, people are listening to this podcast. They're probably thinking, oh gosh, you go to Cape Cod, you're guaranteed to catch fish. And that is definitely not the situation. So when the fish is not on fire, I would say I do something completely different. So if the striped bass bite is just like not working out for me, well, maybe I'll go try to catch a tautog from the beach. Or, gosh, if, uh, you know, there's not many stripers around, it's late summer, it's super hot out, well, that's when the albies show up. So there's so many things that you can do. Brown sharks from shore all summer long. You can try to catch a, a shark from the beach. So if one type of fishing isn't working out for me, it's pretty easy to just find something else that's productive. Yeah. We. Well, you actually moved me into the next one. I was actually going to ask you about seasons. Tell us about the seasons up there and for fishing, please. Well, for striped bass, they typically arrive during May, and they'll stick around into October. In previous years, it seems like they're arriving a little earlier and sticking around much later. And there are some stripers that will hold over during the winter. So you've got stripers pretty much year-round, but most people are interested during spring, summer, and fall. Tuna, they'll arrive usually during June, a little earlier sometimes, and they're still catching them right now. So gosh, we only, really you only go January, February, March, April, some of May without tuna in these waters. And then you've got all sorts of bottom fish, tautog, they arrive mid-April. You can catch them through November. Flounder, more of a springtime. April, May, you've got summer flounder, which start biting July, August, September. What else is there? Oh, the albies, they usually arrive during September, but they've been arriving a little earlier the past few years, more like third week in August. And they'll stick around right through October, sometimes into November. So gosh, what else is there to, I know I'm missing lots of species. There's cod, haddock, we even have some halibut, so I, I'd spend a long time here going through all the species, but I hope that gives you at least an overview. Oh, it does. Absolutely. And I think that's great because that's, oh, all right. I'm going to put my angry hat on here. It's very easy to get 
honed in on one species and one species only. And, you know, a lot of people think New England, they think the stripers. And it's like, oh, striper, striper, striper. It's like, well, hold on. There is a whole cornucopia of different things you can target. Well, I just want to catch this. Okay, well, if you set yourself up for one, you're going to be kind of upset when you don't catch that one, and but you missed out on 15. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, you know, you, you don't... If you set yourself up like that, it's just, it, to me, it's it sets you up for heartache. You know, you, sometimes you just got to change it up. Like you said earlier when you were like, you know, hey, if the striper's not hitting, maybe this will be, and I'll fish for that. Or maybe this will be, and I'll change it up for that. You know, there's just so much you can do. So I love that you brought it up like that. You know, you really presented that very smartly. Well, thank you very much. Um, I know a lot of guys who have saved their trip, you know, saved their tuna trip on the way in by stopping and jigging up some cod or save their striped bass trip by stopping at, you know, a wreck somewhere and jigging up a bunch of black sea bass. So there's always a way of, you know, saving the trip, so to speak. I guess it's a little bit more challenging from the beach because you don't have access to all the species if you're on shore, but the same sort of, you know, theory can be put into practice there. From the beach, I think, don't be afraid to do something completely different um, if, if what you're doing isn't working, whether it's a completely brand new spot. And I think exploring new areas is one of my favorite things to do. Or, you know, fishing at night if you've never fished during the day. Sometimes people will message me and they'll say, gosh, I've been fishing such and such beach for years. I never catch anything. Have you ever gone at night? Because mm-hmm. I know that there's a lot of fish caught there during the night so then they'll just give it a shot and boy that changes everything for them just that one little one little tweak to their approach that's cool that you shared it though i mean that's just shows with this sport of how good it is to be open to knowledge and open to trying new things because like you said just just a little difference in the timeline huge win huge win right right (laughs) Well, thank you. You've done great in this one. So we're going to move into your, well, let's get into your social media stuff and your online presence here. But before we do that, it is that time. We're going to have to knock out one more bait check. It's your second bait check of the episode. Hopefully you caught a bunch of fish. That That's what this show's about. I want you to catch fish. And if you haven't caught yet, hey, change it up. If you haven't changed bait, you know, change it up to a different lure. Change location. Something. Don't, don't be, don't grow roots. Move. Do something different. This bait check is being brought to you by the Kids Can Fish Foundation. Kids Can Fish is a state and federally recognized 501c3 charitable foundation. They do these camps for these kids, and all your donations go into it where the kids go out and they learn cast net, or they learn surf fishing, or they learn a different type of fishing. Whatever gear they use that day, they're taking it home. It's theirs. Yeah. They get the rod, they get the reel, they get the line, they get the cast net, they get all these great things. So all this together gets these kids out of the house and in fishing and learning about it. You can take a look at the website, kidscanfish.net, and you can see all the information on there. They also have the one monster tournament at the end of the year at St. Simon's Island, Georgia, for the running of the bulls tournament. All the money for that, same thing, goes back in, and you can go and you can see how this affects these kids and how many great smiles that it puts on their faces and the knowledge it shares. And like they say, their unofficial slogan, more tackle boxes, less Xboxes. And you're helping out by doing that. Kidscanfish.net's the webpage. Go take a look. So you've been very busy with social media. I mean, you've got a great website, you've got a great presence on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, you've got all this knowledge out there. Tell us how you got started Is this in the digital creator field. Well, about 13 years ago, I read a book called Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow, and I really bought into it. And I read lots of other books too since then, but I just always wanted to be a part of the fishing industry. And I sold some fish early on and I ran some charters, but I just knew that, you know, for me personally, it had to be something a little different than that. And the whole social media thing was happening at that time. And there was a lot of space in the online world for information to be shared. So I just started posting and it kind of just took off. 
and using all those tools that had never been available before, Instagram, social media, cell phones in general, really, all these new tools were popping up like crazy. So I just kind of rode the wave a little bit and just kept at it. And now we've got some really nice communities of people and, you know, some of the members of my site have been on board now for over 10 years. So it's really been an, a fun ride. And to anybody who has kind of a out of the box idea, if you just never give up and just keep plodding away, some really cool things can happen. So don't give up on yourself or your dreams. That's for sure. <laughs> well, you brought it in. Let's talk about it. T tell us about your website. I mean, this thing is, it's a giant library. It's huge. T talk about it. Yeah, the site's been around since 2011. There's a lot of free information on there, free podcasts, videos, articles, advice. If you want access to everything that we have to offer, all our private forums, members only podcasts, other content, events, fishing trips, then people sign up as a member. And right now it's $15 per month or 165 per year. I'm actually doing a holiday bonus right now where I give a bunch of lures out to people who start a membership before the new year. And that's been the, the premise. And it's really turned into more than just a catalog of information. I mean, sure, you can go on there and you can probably cut 10 years off your learning curve by spending a winter going through the articles and watching the videos. But what makes me the happiest and where I think I want to take it moving forward is focusing more on the community component to it. You talked about that amazing uh, group in your previous bait check that's taking kids fishing. Mm -hmm. And I like to do more events and things like that moving forward. You know, that's, that's pretty much my bucket list for this year. Really. It's, I don't have like a fish to catch this year on my bucket list, but I just want to create more opportunities for members of the website to really make the most of this upcoming 2024 season. Wow, oh, man. Community is everything about this. And with, without the, I dare say it, but why not? I'll, I'll ostracize myself. The community is what makes fishing even better because without it, it's just you and the rod. We, we all can learn from each other, make each other better. But hearing the stories, the wins in the community, that's like gold, man. It's so good. It is. And there's still that component of fishing, getting away from everybody and being on your own, too. So I definitely respect being all out there by yourself and fishing alone and just being in nature. But even for those folks, myself included, it's nice to come back and have somebody to share it with. Yeah. You know, growing up, I would, as soon as I got home, I'd run and tell my dad what happened. And if he wasn't around, then I was calling one of my dad's friends to tell him, you know, how the trip went, just to be able to share the experience with somebody. And I think for a lot of people, that's what my fishing Cape Cod has turned into. It's definitely got a lot of that from even from the website starting. You can see that without having to jump in. You can see the growth there. One thing I do love, and I'm backing into the regions thing, I, I can't help myself. It's really kind of cool to talk about, and I do have it up right here. Uh, if you guys go to the website, again, myfishingcapecod.com, and you look at the regions one, you just starting on top, Canal, the Bay, Buzzards Bay, Nantucket Sound, the Vineyard Sound, Outer Cape, the canyons, freshwater, Costa Rica, and Rhode Island. Um, and it, for those of you who have never been to New England, one of the really cool things about that is, you know, you look at a map and you're like, oh, how far is that? I can run from the Cape and be down in Rhode Island. Oh, God. Less than an hour, essentially. I mean, you can, within three hours of yourself, you can go from southeastern Connecticut or even Rhode Island, run up 95 and go nuts. And you could be in Maine within three hours getting after it. It's such a small region that the fishing is just, you can get it anywhere. And you're showing a lot of that here. I mean, there's just so much you can do. There's so much gathering places. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't give it all away. Over the years, there's been a few people who have signed up thinking they are got to get a big map with all the secret spots oh, and the no. coordinates. <laughs> um, 
So it's been a balance. It's been a balance of trying to gauge where people are at in their fishing adventure and just helping them out where they're at without throwing too much at them. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, with what you said about traveling up and down New England here, gosh, you're absolutely right. And we've got folks on the site from Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire. But the one thing everybody has in common is a love of Cape Cod. You know, whether they vacation here, live here full time, or just visit once, they all have that connection to Cape Cod. And the Cape has just been a special fishing destination really for centuries, you know, since before the Europeans arrived. This place has been a crazy hotspot. I've always heard stories of four foot long lobsters just washing up on the beach around here because they were so plentiful. I mean, we think the fishing is good now. You know, can you imagine what it was like a thousand years ago and, oh. and what it could become if, you know, we, we do a little bit better job the coming centuries taking care of our water and the environment. I know that Cape Cod will just explode with um, amazing fishing opportunities in the, in the centuries to come if we can, you know, do a good job moving forward of, of taking care of the water around here. You know, you, you're bringing up something great, and stewardship is huge. And, and I've had a few people like, oh, why do you talk about that? Because it's important. I mean, four generations from now, the idea that we couldn't catch a certain species because of blatant stupidity is unbelievable to me. I mean, the amount of fish, there are other species that are not around because of previous, you know, previous generations overfished it, destroyed a thing. We'll never see that. That's, I mean, it's heartbreaking for me personally because I'm an angler. I would love to see this stuff. I would love to learn about it. I would love to catch it. Hey, if I could, if there was a limit of one and I could have my one, I'd love to eat it. But stewardship is so important and we can't overlook that. Absolutely. And it's not all doom and gloom either. No, no. For all. example, here on Cape Cod, the whaling industry put a huge dent in our population of humpback whales, well, every whale, really. And for years, Nantucket whalers had to sail all the way to South America in order to find whales. And they had been completely, almost completely eradicated from our local waters. And now on a good day, you can go out and see a couple dozen whales bubble feeding and breaching. So it's nice to know that, well, wow, 200 years ago, this wasn't happening. But now it is on a daily basis. So it will come back if you just give it a chance. Yep. Yeah. I remember that in school growing up, learning all about the the whaling industry and how important it was in New England. I mean, with the oils and all uh, all the things, it it was a long class. And then some of the aquariums, they still do the history lessons on it. it. It's a hell of a long subject to learn, but it's a really impressive one to see what they've how far we've come. Oh yeah. And with winter on the horizon here, if you're looking for some good winter reading, the story of the whale ship Essex covers all of that. It's all about the whaling industry here. And if you're a nautical person and you love the ocean and you love adventure, it's a true story. And I definitely recommend checking it out. Definitely a good one there. Uh, So you've... Play, you, like you said, we've got a lot of stuff on the website and your social media. And one other thing I didn't talk about on the website that I pull up, uh, I had a, this tab open in the categories section. I mean, you've got a lot of really cool parts, pieces in here from the food to tackle, miscellaneous nature, uh, fly fishing, inshore, kayak. You're really covering a lot of ground there. So you've got this. It makes me wonder this. What role does social media play in your approach to fishing and does it enhance your experience while, you know, connecting to the sport? Well, social media, it goes both ways for me. I think I have used social media personally for fishing in the past to get on some really epic bites and to stay on the fish because without that instant connectivity, I wouldn't be able to message certain people that have helped me tremendously get on the bite in almost real time, which is sometimes a problem. But on the other end of the spectrum, especially this past summer, I kind of unplugged a little bit from that world and just didn't listen or look at 
the social media posts of a lot of the big fish that are being caught in my backyard <laughs> because the, the fear of missing out was really, was really affecting me. You know, I'd see a, a picture and I'd be like, oh man, I was just there a few hours later. Um, I didn't know I missed that epic bite. So I kind of just unplugged from it a little bit this past summer and just went about my business and fished a lot of my local waters, places where I fished more when I was younger and just kind of relearned some places that I hadn't been to in a long time. So I think for me, social media can be really helpful to get on the fish and learn new things, but it can also be kind of harmful if I find myself living a little bit too much through it, if that makes sense. It definitely does. The FOMO is real. It's it's very easy to be like, and just get angry at it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And that's something that's always affected me in fishing is hearing about, you know, the guy in the boat over there or the, the folks who went down to the canal while I slept in and they did well, you know, that fear of missing out is, has been a, something I've dealt with my whole life, but I feel like I finally got a good handle on it now at the age of 38. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, this question actually rocked, works into that one because we're talking about balance here. So how do you balance running all the social media, running the website, YouTube, the podcast, and still maintain your happiness while fishing? Well, I'm surrounded by some awesome people. My wife, Lauren, you know, she encouraged me to do this from the start and she helps out a lot. I've got great parents, great family. I've got great people who are part of my fishing Cape Cod helping me out. Some amazing sponsors that without what they've done over the past several years, a lot of what I've created wouldn't have come to fruition. So I've got all these great people around me helping me out. And, you know, I'm just so thankful for them. But aside from that, on a more personal level, I definitely spend a lot of time away from that whole world. I like to dive in, but then get out of it and spend a lot of time in nature, a lot of time in my garden. We started growing a lot of our own food. I really got into foraging for berries and stuff during the summer. So I spent a lot of time in the social media online world, but I definitely spent a lot of time in the in the real world, you know, the natural world. And I think that helps out a lot. Um, but especially if you're running an online business, there's lots of great resources as well. Um, and moving forward, I am going to be hiring more virtual assistants and other people to kind of help keep things moving ahead so I can spend more time in the garden, hopefully, um, and less time fixing technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> Very good call. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot. If you, if anyone here has a website, it's uh, challenging dealing with all the technology. So I hear you. And it's painful, man. It's so painful. <laughs> yeah, you know, with the podcast, I'm I'm sure some technical stuff has tr driven you crazy getting this podcast going. Oh yeah, I call that Monday now. <laughs> it's always like, yeah. oh, here we go again. Why did it go that way? Uh, yeah, and farming it out, man, is, it's, yeah, I guess it's a business thing, I say it like this, you know, once you build the baby, it's your baby, you know, and you're like, do I want my baby to be in the hands of somebody else? Do I trust you? Are you going to take care of my baby? You know, it's, it's a hard thing to let go and let people help you, and, you know, it, the help is going to be good as long as it's good help, but it really, it makes a difference. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm hopefully going to get better at delegating, delegating things moving forward because um, I spend a lot of time in the business fixing things and doing all sorts of stuff in the business. But I'd like to spend more time on the business. And I think the more I can spend time on the business and improving things, you know, I'd like to take my fishing Cape Cod from good where I think it is right now and make it great. Make it something that could last beyond me, something that could last for generations 
and have a positive influence for generations to come. But in order to do that, I need to figure out a way to keep this thing going and growing without me as part of the equation. I'll always be part of it for as long as I'm here on this earth, God willing, you know. But once I'm gone, I want to make sure it can continue to to exist beyond me. Mm -hmm. Well, this brings into another going on. What has been one of the biggest lessons learned after doing this? Hmm. I guess balance. You know, it's something we've talked about earlier on in today's show. Because with work, and I, I'm sure so many of us can relate to this, it's so easy to get all consumed. And before you know it, you haven't even looked up at the stars in a week. So it's really taught me the value of, of having balance and working hard, but also being able to balance that with just being on this planet, which is pretty wild if you think about it. So yeah, balance. Balance is key. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I think everybody listening just took a pause and goes, oh, yeah, I did forget it. You know, my uh, my daughter likes to tell me this one. And I, I love it because I, I know she found it on social media, but she's like, dad, got to touch the grass. I'm like, oh, you're right. I do. I got to get out and touch the grass. And it's easy to get consumed with everything going on. It just sucks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how many... When's the last time you touched something in nature? That's exactly what your daughter's getting at. Yep. You know, I know I've, I've touched my phone today for hours, but, you know, have I touched a tree or, or leaves without getting too wonky funky on this podcast here? But it's really true. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time with artificial devices, but the nice thing about fishing is you're, you're touching the bait. You're, you're getting your hands sandy you're you're dealing with fish so you're you're literally touching nature which i think in this day and age it's pretty easy to go a week or two without doing that unfortunately yes very much so mm -hmm. well we've been going for an hour here so let's knock out the final bait check of the episode All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've made it. You're doing good. Yep, you're doing real well. You got a bunch of fish. I know you did. I know you're listening to this on the car ride home because you were just out for an hour. Like, I, I got my limit. I don't need to do anything else. Nope. That, that'd be great. If you haven't caught yet, hey, definitely make a change. Think about what you did. Look at that log book. Maybe you need to move something different time. You got to look around. Always keep that log book handy. This bait check is being brought to you by The Sinker Guy. Go over to thesinkerguy.com and look at everything that Chip's got going on in The Sinker Guy garage. You need the Bruno rig? He's got you. Maybe the Uno or maybe the mortician, or hey, maybe you need sinkers, because it's in his name. Yeah, he's got you covered there. Sputniks, different sizes, weights, and if you need special, reach out to him. He might be able to help you out. Lots of great resources on the website to get your hands on, and his social media has got a lot of good knowledge pieces on there that get you covered out in the uh, little bit of travels he's been doing. So thesinkerguy.com is the website. Go take a look. So with the constant piece there, and a nice move talking about balance in life, uh, what advice do you have for aspiring creators that want to blend the passion for, for their fishing into creative endeavors? Well, stay consistent with it, be disciplined, but don't give up um, on any dream, no matter how bananas it might seem. If it feels right, it's got to feel right. It's got to feel natural. Don't give up. Absolutely don't give up on it. It might take you know, a decade for it to really come to fruition. But if it feels right, if you know it's something that you were put on this planet to do, just stick with it. And, um, you know, there's a famous quote that's always stuck with me. Don't die with your music left inside of you. Make sure you play your music, even if it's not perfect. Get it out there and um, good things will happen. Oh, dude, that's a great quote. Man. Love that. Yeah, it really sums it up. I don't know who, you know, who said that, but don't die with your music still left inside of you. So good. So good. Well, um, weird last business question here, then we'll get you into the closing questions. Do you have a mentor? And if so, what has that done for you? Um, you know, I don't really have a business mentor, but I do read a lot 
of business and spiritual spirituality books. Um, so without that, God, I don't, I don't even want to know where I'd be without that dimension of, of my life. Um, so no, not a specific mentor, but just a lot of great people out there who probably have no idea the impact they've had on my life, but they, they've had a huge impact. Man, that's good stuff. I and mean, the book thing, I'm, I'm a big proponent of it. I actually made a post and I, I'm not going to go on a tangent with this for you for too long, but I made a post not too long ago on Facebook and it was asking people, Hey, what do you read? Uh, you know, what books are you reading? What have you read that's helped you in your adventures? And the lack of response actually bothered me. And I was like, what do you mean you guys aren't reading these books? What do you mean you're not reading? You know, it doesn't have to be about fishing. What business books have you read? What, what life-changing things have you read? What, what is this? And the lack of people to tell me, oh, I read this. It helped me. It, it rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> right. But it was like, right. what do you mean you haven't read a book? You haven't done an audio book. What, what, why? What are you missing? And I feel like that's a, I don't want to say a, a, a lack. I know we're all busy. But there's so many great things that people have written from the dawn of time to now that are helpful. And it, it's like it, you're, we're missing out on a piece, it seems. It's like a piece of the puzzle has fallen off the table and we can't find it. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, 100%. So I think investing in yourself first and foremost, you know, putting time every single day to invest in, in yourself is really, really important. Um, cause it's so easy to just, you know, an hour goes by and you've just been scrolling on your, on your feed. Even if you just spent 20 minutes investing in yourself, whether that's learning a new skill or reading a spiritual book or just something, whatever resonates with you, making time to do that every day, I think will really help a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. I know it's really helped me. I've got a long ways to go, but. I, I definitely try to spend a little time every day uh, reading something or learning something that will help my business or just me as a human being. Good on you, man. Got to free, got to feed the brain matter. Got to keep that thing moving. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get you these last couple questions here and we'll get you on with your day. Uh, let's talk about for the beginners here. What's for someone just starting out into surf fishing and surf casting, what's one piece of advice you'd give them to set them on the right path? Well, it would be really good to go into a local bait shop. That's really the easiest way to get rigged up with everything you need. So you can cut out, you know, six months of the learning curve by just establishing a good relationship with the local bait and tackle store in whatever, whatever area you're fishing. Um, you know, that's first and foremost right there. I don't know what, what do you think about that, Bry? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I mean the bait, the bait shop has gone a long way from when we were kids. You know, it's not the the sale shop or, or anything like that. Now, granted, it was the place where Dad was in there for twenty minutes. You're like, oh God, can we go fish? But now it's it's even better. The way technology has changed, the way people have changed, it's such a good place to start. So that will get you started with equipment, and then obviously there's so many resources available now. You know, if you went back 50, 60 years ago or 100 years ago, fishing was still an incredibly secretive endeavor and there were no books or websites. But now you can just, you know, whether you pay for something or just spend time on, on YouTube, productively spending time on YouTube, learning about fishing, you can cut another several years of the learning curve right there. So you can utilize the bait shop, you can utilize technology, and then just uh, going. I see a lot of folks, they've got the gear, they might subscribe to my website, but for whatever reason, they never end up really doing much fishing. And that can happen to me too from time to time. You just got to carve out a little time where you're just, you're just got to go. So those are the three uh, tips that I'd give an answer to that question. <laughs> great. Yeah, great answers right there. That's for sure. Where can listeners find more of your content, learn from your experiences and stay up to date on your adventures? If you just Google my fishing Cape Cod, all sorts of stuff will pop up. So whether you spend your time on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, if you want to visit my website, that'd be terrific. 
we've got a new season of My Fishing Cape Cod TV that's got to be starting on February 24th. So if you're in New England, if you get NBC Sports Boston at 9.30 a.m. on Saturdays starting February 24th, you can tune in there. And then we'll be doing all sorts of events. And I also plan on doing some Zoom gatherings and trying to get people together live on Zoom calls throughout the spring, um, just to really set us all up for success this 2024 season. Man, that's so cool. As I'm sitting here in my Red Sox sweatshirt and I'm all like, ah, I know NBC Sports Boston. <laughs> that's such a oh, cheesy yeah. thing of me. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, they've been really great to me. Um, we've had a great relationship and this will be the seventh year that we've had a show with them. So I, I hope it's a good season. We're going to do everything from tautog fishing to harpooning giant bluefin tuna. Oh, man. Right. Congratulations, man. That's so awesome. Well, thank you. I mean, this has been really terrific, and I'm glad that your podcast is doing great, and I can't thank you enough for having me on. Well, I, I'm just having fun, and this is this is what it's all about, the conversations, meeting good people, and, and just enjoying. I love this whole thing about it, so... Thank you. And the last question, we'll get you out of here. What's next for you? Well, I'm toying around with the idea of launching a My Fishing Rhode Island, as well as a My Fishing Boston and other sites for different areas. And they would start as a private forum. And the benefit of that is there'd be a small join fee or a monthly fee, but there'd be no advertisement. So a lot of times you're scrolling on social media and the internet, there's just a lot of ads, but with this new idea that I'm working on, it'd be a completely ad-free environment and it's just a community uh, component to it. So more on that to come, but I am thinking about taking the concept that I've worked here on Cape Cod and trying it out in some different regions. Great stuff, man. That will be so cool to see. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Oh, wow. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And then aside from that, well, I'm hoping to have another successful year in the garden here and um, just keep the wife happy. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. Really, I mean that. I, seriously, it's been so much fun talking with you, learning from you, and, and thank you for sharing your life and time and experience with us here on the show. I really do appreciate it, and uh, I, I look forward to talking with you soon. Uh, that's awesome, Brian. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the listeners. It's been a pleasure. All right, sir. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, hope you had a good time there in New England. I just did. I absolutely loved this. That was so much fun. If you want to find out more, like I said, go to the website, myfishingcapecod.com. Lots of good stuff on there. Or you can fire it up in the phone. Just Google it. And like he said, lots of good things are coming there. You've been listening to Finding Demo Surf Fishing. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. It's always fun having this time with you. Go out there, catch some fish, take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week. I am out of here. (laughs) 